Hi. Yeah. Well, how's, th how's that? Good. Good. Okay, cool. Let's just get right into it, should we? Sure. Okay. Um, so this is a question I like to ask a lot of people that I talk to. Um, when did you start to develop your taste in music? So I started getting into, I think like Tracy Chapman and Janis Joplin were kind of the first things where I was like, oh, this is something that is interesting to me. I'm going to seek it out outside of the radio. And I, the things that were always really interesting to me on pop radio were, well, what I realized later is that I was like looking for the punk rock and things, but I didn't know what punk was. I think I thought it was something much scarier than it was. Uh, and and I'd, maybe I'd heard The Clash on like, you know, again, classic rock radio. Um, and then I was just like, I was like getting the B-52s and just kind of, there was some very um, interesting pop happening uh, right around that time. Like you could hear some very interesting things on the radio and Nana Cherry and the B-52s and Delight and just things that were definitely weirder. And then um, uh, a few weeks into ninth grade, um, someone, someone came up to me, we were like sitting out, we were both like the kids that wouldn't dress for gym, you know, we're just sitting there like, no, I'm not putting on like a uniform and shorts and like whatever, you know. And he came up to me and he said, are you, are you a hippie or a punk? Like I cannot figure it out from how you're dressed. And um, I was like, I don't know. And he's like, I'm bringing you a tape tomorrow. And it was, you know, Babes in Toyland, Butthole Surfers, Pussy Galore, uh, the boredoms, like really dropping me into like the deep end of um, a kind of progressive noise slash American indie rock at that time. And it was like, oh, this is, this is the thing. This is the thing that I was looking for in all of this other music is this, this wildness. I think it's, it's funny. It echoes a very, a very similar experience. I think I had in a lot of people of the pre-internet generation had about kind of getting into punk and underground music through just someone being like, you look weird, like, here's this, <laughs> you know. Um, it definitely echoes my own a bit. And I get, so we can relate to that. So that's your own taste. How about values, right? So pretty soon after that, I guess, I, that's what I don't know. I feel like you're known, you have strong opinions. You definitely have sort of independent <laughs> DIY, certain and other feminist values. When did you start sort of to develop those? Was there something that happened? Was it, was it slow? Uh, no, because I think, I think even in, you know, Tracy Chapman, in Janis Joplin, in even like these kind of earlier things where I was toddling into music that felt like maybe it could be mine, um, the, I wanted, I, what I was seeking in part from music, I realized was, you know, so, I guess social messages. You know, I wanted rebellion. I wanted, um, you know, this was a time where there was, I, w I went to like a lot of protests. Before I was into punk and music, I just, um, I didn't like go to camps and stuff during the summer or whatever when I was a kid, like literally like fifth, sixth grade. Um, I started volunteering uh, in, where I lived in Minneapolis. A lot of the nonprofit organizations were all in the same building and I would literally do kind of like a rotation. And so it was like, you know, I would answer phones at like, you know, it was like US out of Nicaragua on Wednesdays. And then I would go do like, um, you know, kind of dialing for dollars with, uh, you know, NARAL, which is like an abortion rights. Uh, you know, I, I can't imagine what it was like to get a phone call from somebody being like, do you support abortion? And I literally was like 12 years old, you know? <laughs> and, um, and, you know, laying down on freeway on ramps to, uh, you know, protest the Gulf War and stuff like that. And so finding music that also um, m maybe they didn't have those exact values, but they were speaking truth to power in that way, was, you know, was part of the lure of punk rock, was part of the lure of 
folk music uh, to a certain lesser extent um, was the lure of public enemy, was the lure of Nana Cherry, um, and some things that were really fundamental to me. Um, and so um, I already kind of had those, I was coming to my interest in, in underground music with those values and wanting something that reflected and deepened that because at, at the time, um, you know, there was a huge gulf in a way that I think is, is sort of hard to imagine now between the values of the underground and the values of the mainstream. You know, mainstream media did not reflect anything about teenage girls that was like very cool or positive or anything and so then when you know after getting into punk rock and i was working at a record store and um one of the people that i worked with said um there's this band that just started bikini kill and they're coming on tour it's gonna be their first tour and here's their tape and um i got really excited i didn't know what they looked like i didn't know like anything i just knew the music and it was really kind of like scary exciting and it was it was one of the first times that i had heard kind of an explicit feminism in music. And granted, you know, one of the things that had like really um, brought me into independent music was seeing women in bands. And in particular, this band Babes in Toyland, um, who were um, really coming up at that time in Minneapolis. So I got to see them all the time. But before that point, I, you know, it was like I'd been going to hardcore shows, and this was kind of like, uh, m maybe just past the peak of like, you know, American hardcore. It was very much like dudes in tearaway track pants, like doing these kind of like, you know, and I was like, oh, is, is this, is this punk rock? Like, it, cause this is not connecting for me. It's like this macho, shirtless dude, like just being like, I'm straight edge and fuck everybody who isn't kind of thing. And I was like, I don't know, man. That's like hardly a value, you know? <laughs> it was like that real like um, vegan Reich kind of stuff. Um, Google it. Um, but it was like, it was just, it was just kind of like a boring. Like macho dudes in any field. Like it was just like not interesting. And then so when I started seeing women in bands, it was very... That was really exciting to me, and I was like, and there, there was a real insurgency to that. Right when I was coming into punk rock, and then I went and saw Bikini Kill and, and um, interviewed Kathleen Hanna, and I mean, at the time we were all like, I was literally like 15, 16, and she was like, oh, here's these zines, and if you write to me at this address or these other, like, it was just like, well, send us like $2, we'll send you. Our zines and and I was doing a zine and and it was like um, riot girl and radical punk rock feminism, really. It was like very hand to glove, you know. It was like it gave a name and a shape and uh, I don't know. It was it just sort of endowed my rage, you know, uh, and it endowed my politics and. It was so exciting for me to see that these two things could really fit and that there could be kind of a specific agenda around it. And so I fully threw myself into what was at that time kind of the real nascence of the Riot Girl movement in America. Well, something about the one mic makes this feel like a, um, a fanzine interview where it's like, question. <laughs> Question. It's a but, little more of war, but yeah, it feels. It, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, also that. Um, so you just touched on a lot of things that I think I, I want to try to get into in our discussion, and one of them is this. You talk about in in your book about your frustration with how bands like Davidson and Toyland were being covered, and how that sort of drove you to start writing about music. Um, and I guess my question was kind of what made you choose music writing as your sort of weapon of choice in that, in that fight? Because I think in a lot of ways, I feel like that's part of what made me want to start a label, was this same yeah. frustration with like, this stuff is, I see this thing, no one cares about it, I'm really frustrated about it, I'm gonna put out my own rec, you know, I'm gonna just do that, and you sort of chose this weapon of like music writing, I'm wondering what kind of made you 
want to do that and what gave you the idea to start a fanzine as, as sort of like, this is a thing that I should, this is how I should participate, right? There are so many ways to participate in, in scenes back then. No one's ever asked me that. That's interesting. Um, why was it a fanzine? Why was it writing? Well, part of it was, um, again, like imagine, if you will, a picture, if you will. Um, you know, it's like Minneapolis, 1990, 1991. Um, there's been kind of an alternative boom happening, you know, replacements, who's gonna do? There's a lot of incredible music happening all around me, but Minneapolis is still considered kind of like a second tier music city. And even, I don't want to say like despite that, but um, how do I not get into the weeds of this? Minneapolis had churned out a lot of uh, music writers. It was like kind of a place where there was, I think because in a way it was sort of cloistered, you know? Um, it was a place people would hit on tour, but there was a lot of, um, at that time, <coughs> there was a lot of stuff happening there, and so we had um, several monthly or bi-weekly or bi-monthly all-music publications, and a lot of them, you know, would cover touring acts that had just come through or were coming through or, you know, all of these things because it was like um, independent media um, aside from, you know, there was like two local weeklies at the time as well. It was pre-internet. So this is like really a long time ago, when I was 15. This is literally 30 years ago. And, um, and that, was, that was one of the ways that you just participated. It was like what, I, I've talked about this before sometimes, but I remember standing at the door of the 7th Street entry, which is like this little venue that I went to all the time that was um, adjacent to First Avenue, um, which is the big venue, which if you've seen Purple Rain, you've seen. Um, and I remember some guy who was kind of like big in the scene, I mean, I thought he was like a shitty person, but whatever, I'm, I'm getting in the weeds. <laughs> was saying about somebody, they just go to shows. They don't, you know, they don't do anything. They just go to shows. They just show up and come to shows. People were like, <laughs> you know, and it was like, because it was a small enough scene and it was that like everybody kind of did something because you had to do you had to do something to kind of keep it alive you know whether that was play in a band or um you know promote shows or book shows or um you know i mean i think part of the reason i did a fanzine is because i knew other people that did fanzines I knew teenagers that did fanzines. I, I worked at a record store and we had, you know, half a dozen regularly publishing zines. So it was just, very, it was just something you did. And, um, you know, and I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be one of those people that somebody could go, well, they just go to shows, you know. I wanted to, to be a very active part of this thing, but also, you know, like you said, I had opinions. And I, I don't think I understood that maybe it was, I don't want to say strange, but yes, I knew a lot of people doing fanzines. I didn't know any women doing fanzines at all. Um, I knew women that wrote about music, but so being a very opinionated 15 year old who had been into music for like literally a few months. I was like, here are all of my definitive opinions and like, you know, drive bys and all of this stuff. But it was just, um, I don't know. I, 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 I don't, I don't know where that necessarily came from. My mom was a editor at the newspaper. So maybe that was like somehow like the idea of like, well, you just put out a thing or I don't, I don't know, but it really was like, I did it in part because I wanted to be part of something and also because I didn't see the ideas that I had about music reflected elsewhere. And also one of the other things is that um, 
This was this kind of like great convenient fallacy of my teenage thinking is that um, at the time, the music critic, at, the really good music critic that was at one of the two alt weeklies was a woman named Terry Sutton, who was at, at the time a very, um, very well respected feminist critic. And I thought, well, there's a feminist critic at the alt weekly, like every, every city must have one. So this is like a normal thing. Turns out there was only two of them. It was Ann Powers and Terry Sutton, and Ann Powers is now at, you know, is Ann Powers. Um, and, uh, um, and I just thought, oh, this is like something, something women do, <laughs> uh, is be feminist music critics. And even though I didn't identify as a critic, um, you know, I think it was really you know, I kind of stood on my own authority, but then again, to, to kind of return to Riot Girl, I understood from Riot Girl too that it was this idea that asserting that my ideas and my opinions about music was kind of part of this larger agenda um, to be in dialogue with my community. So. Well, yeah, you, I mean, you developed sort of a very unique voice that I feel like you're known for, and a lot of that voice, I'm just thinking while you're talking, is, <laughs> is very self-reflective, um, and it maybe at times introspective, and I guess the other thing I'm kind of curious about while we're in the past, we'll start, we'll move, well, I promise we'll move out of it we'll soon. We'll move out of me being in high school. We'll promise we'll move out of high school. <laughs> well, in a way we I already... Promise 50 oh. Joe, we can go forward. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll move forward. Well, in a way, th this will be moving forward. But um, I guess I'm wondering when you started to actually be able to articulate some of these things, right? There's so much of participating in these scenes, communities, values. You're just kind of like doing things that make sense to you. And it's not until you're a little older you start to say, oh, this is why I was doing this. This is kind of what, what drew me to that. Was there a point where you felt like you started to understand like why you were, like you, like you just said, you put it all together as part of this much bigger agenda. Was there kind of an aha moment or did that just, has that not hit you yet? I don't know if that's so hard. I'm sorry, it will get easier. No, it's not hard. It's, um, uh, I kind of wrote about this in the afterward yeah. to, the, to the second edition of the first collection, which is the orange book that was somehow floating around, around here. I do need to um, actually, somewhere second. No. Who's got it? It's like a where's Waldo yeah. situation. Um, you know, uh, there's so many things that I, d I didn't think about it. I just followed my curiosity. Excuse me. We don't need me, we don't need me burping directly into the mic. Um, I don't know when my aha moment was. I started writing, you know, the word professionally is a little tricky. I mean, the first time I started getting paid to write, I was like 16, and I was writing for the Alt Weekly, and I was writing for other publications, and um, and then, but I didn't, you know, I didn't think I, it was just one of the things I did because I also worked with music, I worked at little record labels, I worked at a, in the mailroom of a, a label called Amphetamine Reptile during my summers uh, as a teenager, and then I worked at record stores, and I, this, that, and the other thing. And I started um, doing PR, because I just like to talk about music that I believed in. I mean, I literally was just like, okay, what, what am I kind of, I'm naturally evangelical about the things that I love. Um, and I was always still writing on the side, but um, maybe because I didn't have uh, any kind of proper education. I, d I don't know. I don't know why. D it took me a little while to think of myself as a writer. Um, and I was still publishing my fanzine until I was 28. And by then, it was like a full color magazine for a little bit. Um, and, and, and um, you know, had like 50 people <laughs> writing for it. And it was, and still, I didn't really think of myself as an editor. And I didn't really, you know, because this was just like what I did and what I loved. And, um, I don't ever. I don't think I've ever thought of myself as someone with hobbies. But, anyways, when I was about like 28-ish, 
I'd had a lot of people asking me, you know, when are you, I, I had started like a little independent PR company that had grown quite a bit. And I only worked with independent bands and record labels and, you know, all the bands, Alkaline Trio, At The Drive-In, Gossip, like everybody. I worked, as maybe you remember, like I worked with like every, Jimmy World when they were a little band, you know, like it was just like everybody. And, but I got really tired of promoting other people's art and I was really feeling kind of the primacy of my own. And it was starting to feel inevitable that I was just, a lot of people wanted me to write, but they were saying like, well, you work with all these bands and you're still kind of like tied up in these parts of the music industry where you're getting paid to promote things. We need things to be like a little cleaner. So like when you're done, you can come write for us. Um, and I was really nervous and I, I was like, I guess I'm a writer. I guess I'm a writer. And I, I just became almost like physically incapable of kind of putting all my focus on bands and playing in bands and stuff like that. It's sort of like um, the end of my time in the music industry, the analogy that I always use is like, um, it's like working at a restaurant, you never want to eat there again once you've like worked in the kitchen. Yeah. And it kind of ruined like being in bands for me and other stuff. I was just like, this is like not the struggle I'm invested in. Um, I was more interested in like, I wanted to, I wanted to really have my own thing and so, um, I was like, all right, I'm quitting music and I'm gonna go write full time. I'm gonna just see if I can do it. If I can make 800 bucks a month. My rent was 250. I lived in a shithole. And um, but I was like, if I can make 850 a month, I can, I can make a living. <laughs> I did make 850 a month, guys. Um, but, you know, I was like DJing. I was like performing in like a roller skating troupe. I was doing all these, <laughs> I was doing all, we would do, we would do, we performed with this famous Chicago drag queen and we had like outfits, it was like a whole, it was like very electric clash era, we're not gonna get into it. Um, and, but you know, slowly but surely, it was like all these things kind of came in really quickly and it was like within a month or two, it was like the ground rose to meet my feet professionally, you know, it was like two months later I got a job at This American Life doing, um, I worked on that show for like nine years as the music supervisor, <laughs> something I had no experience doing. <laughs> but you know, I DJed all the fucking time. Um, but yeah, and, and really starting to get like regular writing gigs. I didn't learn, I didn't actually learn how to write for like another year or two. I was publishing very regularly despite this. But when I look back at it now, it's like, um, you know, the first, two years was just trying to figure out like, how do I write for a broader audience of like, you know, 100,000 people or something at the Chicago Reader, whatever the circulation was, as opposed to this kind of cloistered world where if I'm like, oh, this is like pavement meets the blah, blah, you know, just kind of this like more low level kind of fanzine style criticism. Um, when I was doing that, it was like, that wasn't really about writing. It was about my taste. I was like, you make a joke, do a little drive-by on some crappy band, you know? Like, it wasn't, it wasn't real criticism. And so, it was a while before I think I thought like, oh, that's, that's it. That, this is what I do. It was like a year or two into literally working as a full-time freelance critic that I was like, oh, I'm starting to understand all of this because the other thing too is that I didn't go to college. Sorry guys. Um, <laughs> I didn't go to college. I had no formal training <laughs> in being a writer other than like basic ass high school composition. <laughs> you know, like everything else, I was very autodidactic and I just read like a motherfucker. And, um, that was how I learned everything, was just like following my curiosity. That's how I did all the work that I did was just pure curiosity and was like, well, I'm gonna learn it by doing, whether it was DJing or the aforementioned roller skating or you know, uh, writing fanzines or playing bass in a band or all of those things, I just, I just did them. So I don't know if aha moments happened, but 
It just, it just was. No, and I'm glad you mentioned that, um, the afterword to the new edition, because that's what made me think when I'm reading it, it feels so linear, but I kind of know it's never, it's never like that. So that's why I was wondering, it feels like at some point you were able to organize all of this in a way that kind of <laughs> made sense, but maybe it was not until you actually sat down to write that, I don't know. Um, but, so technically I guess you were starting to write your second book, technically first, but let's start with, right, in a way, because, so. but, but um, let's start with kind of the first book you published, this, um, The Girl's Guide to Rocking, so that was 2009. I guess I'm curious, like, what sort of inspired that, what made you want to write a book like that, um, and how that, how that kind of come about? Um... Maybe explain it, but I realize Okay, so my first book is called The Girl's Guide to Rocking. It's for um, girls, but anyone can use it. Um, the, that was a joke. Um, the, it was for like tween, teen girls, and it was kind of a DIY-ish guide about you know, starting a band and you want to play shows and you want to record yourself and you um, you want to record in your house. You want to learn how to play guitar. You want to learn how to write lyrics. And it was like kind of like a how-to. I mean, in a lot of ways, it was basically like a very long feminist fanzine for people who were like 14. And I got a lot of great um, help from from folks who knew about things that I didn't, you know, uh, then uh, starting on her career, you know, Annie Clark of St. Vincent, and like all these kind of random people that um, were just kind of my friends through the scene where I was like, tell me about pedals, you know, like stuff that I knew about, but like some help. Um, and, uh, but that book came about because my friend Franz, who played in the Hold Steady, his sister worked at a publisher and asked him because he was like deep in the. Yeah, so uh, Franz, is, Franz introduced me to his sister who said, I wanna do a book that's like for girls about how to start a band. And this was also kind of like when um, girls rock camps were kind of starting to happen. That was still pretty new. And, um, and it really felt like, oh, this, this is like an interesting sea change kind of moment. Oh, hey. We got some batteries, like, uh, okay, great. Now we're cooking with gas. Okay. Um, uh, I had never, I was like, yeah, okay, great. So you'll just send me the, and she was like, now you got to write the proposal for this book. And I was like, oh, but you, like, you said you want me to do it, and I want to do it. Like, I was just, <laughs> I was like, they're just going to hand me the keys, kind of. Um, and instead, I just had to write the whole proposal. Um, so that, that's how that book came about. And that was pretty, that was pretty wild. Um, my, uh, my dad got an accident, almost died uh, when I was in the middle of doing the book. And I had a very fixed timeline for when it had to be done. And my life just sort of like, I literally like dropped everything and was on a plane. And I had, ha and I had, I had maybe like, um, 20,000 words of the book written. And then I just went and like basically lived in a, you know, a hospital with my dad for a couple months and <laughs> um, in LA. And then my publisher called and she said, um, we're gonna have to push the publication on this for two years if you don't turn it in in seven weeks. And by that point, my dad was like better. He was walking and stuff and I could, I could go. And I was like, Okay, yeah, I can do that. Came back home and I like did my word count. I was like, Jesus fucking Christ, what have I committed myself to? And I did like the kind of like reverse math on it. And I was like, I have to write 2,400 usable words every single day for the next five weeks. And so I wrote and researched uh, from nine to nine every single day until it was done. And as I would finish things, I would, they would go out to like six friends who had 
different sorts of technical knowledge and also people who are like general readers or whatever so that they could give me notes back, which is what you have to do when you have any kind of like book manuscript because you're just, you're so in it, you cannot see out of it. And um, it was absolutely maniacal. But this I was, did it. Yeah, this was before chat GPT also. Yes. <laughs> and and um, and there weren't other books out there that I could like pull from, really. You know, there weren't there was books about how to write lyrics. They're pretty s stupid. And so um, you know, every day I would be like literally call like being like, Hey, are you available tomorrow at this time? I'm gonna call it like and it would just bang out notes and, and interview people over the phone and be like, what do you think of this idea? Because there were certain things that were so technical about it that I didn't, that I didn't know. And so that was how that book got made. And then I did a big, I did a, um, excuse me, I did a big tour around it and um, I had brought a band out with me that is now the band Ostra, if people know them. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I met nine-year-old girls that I still hear from who are like professional musicians now. It was really, it was really special. It really, um, I'm really glad that happened even though it was like a total hell on earth book process. That's really cool. Um, yeah, sorry, let's, let's move. Um, yeah, well, we're in 2009. We can, you know, it's like, it, it's know. in like the recent, I mean, it's like what past 9-11. Oh, Jesus. Okay, you know? it's already, yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry, yeah, that's so, grim. That was fucking grim. Well, like I said, so technically you would, you'd already started on your, on your, <laughs> right into the microphone. Here, um, technically you'd already started on, um, on your collection because it was a collection, right? Um, Why don't we give some context there? Well, that's what I was going to... Okay. okay, fine. I'll let you finish. You can give the context. Give no, the context? no, you do okay. it. I don't know where you're going with this, but... I don't, I don't totally either, so let's, let's see where we go. Um, so, your first collection, the, the first collection book, which was, had kind of this incendiary title, right? The first collection of criticism by a living female rock critic. Um, it almost felt obvious in retrospect that that should happen, but actually it it probably didn't at the time, right? This idea of like compiling a bunch of sort of like felt scattered writing over the years and putting together this this collection. So I guess I was I was kind of curious, which will give it context also for what it is. Kind of what gave you the the idea to compile to compile that writing, and then why then? Like why at that point in your career did it feel like this is when I want to yeah kind of do like a greatest hits collection of writing like that? Hmm. Um. Yeah, no, uh, let's see. So at that point, when this, when we were putting this book together, what was that, like 2012? Is it 20? 20? when it actually came out. Yes, no, but it took, it took like a year and a half, two years before it came out, I think. Um, people had been asking me for a long time, when, I, when was I going to put out like a, uh, a collection of, you know, my Punk Planet columns. When was I going to put out a collection of this? When was I going to put out, you know, put all this old uh, stuff from my fanzine together? And I'd actually signed a book contract with um, Akashic, which is Johnny Temple's now very successful uh, book imprint. Um, but I never, I never delivered it, and I'm glad I didn't because my writing at that time was just. I don't think I'd ever written anything that was like longer than like maybe 800 words. You know, I mean, that's like not great book reading. And um, I'd been thinking about it and um, a friend of mine had just sort of inherited Featherproof Press and he came to me and said, would you like to, I'd like to do a collection of your writing. And I was like, okay, great. This seems like an okay time to do it. And um, <clears throat> we got we got into the business of kind of combing the archives. I'd been writing at that point full time for like four or five years and writing for a lot of different places and national magazines and local weeklies and um, 
I was a columnist for the Village Voice. I was a columnist. I mean, where didn't I have a column? Um, I was a columnist at the Village Voice. I was a columnist uh, about local music at the Chicago, no, not quite at the Chicago Tribune. I was still doing a lot of stuff for the Reader, the Chicago Reader, um, which is now the oldest still continuously publishing alt-weekly in America. It's been going since 1971. All the other major ones have died out. Um, and I was writing a lot of long form stuff. Like that was a time and place where you could do a 2800 word review of a Sufjan Stevens record. <laughs> like literally does, is not a thing that can still exist. Um, he still does make records though, doesn't yeah. he? I yeah, don't know. I think so. Anyways, uh, and I had had some pieces that were very, are now like the landmark pieces of my career. Some of them, Ema, Where the Girls Aren't, mm -hmm. and um, uh, Big Lana Del Rey thing, you know, first big profile of Kendrick Lamar for Spin, uh, like a handful of stuff like that. That was like what people knew me for. And the R. Kelly piece. And, and so it just seemed there, were, there was some real, some things had really like happened in my career in the previous few years. So it just made sense to do that, um, I guess. And we were joking about what it would be titled. And I had, I had told him, you know, I had, I told my friend who would put out the book, I said, um, you know, after I did Girls Guide to Rocking, I had, I had talked to some editors and people that had come to me, people that work at publishers, agents, and they're like, well, what do you want to do next? And I said, you know, I want to do an anthology of my work. And they're like, that's a fifth book. <laughs> that's like, that's not a second book. Collections don't sell, essays don't sell, music doesn't sell, feminism doesn't sell. And it was like, no one was like, yeah. And I was just like, this is so fucked. This is so fucked. And, um, and I had said to one of them, I said, you know, to, to one of these editors, you know, I said, there hasn't been a collection of music criticism, like an anthology of music criticism, by a living female rock critic ever published. Like, you're telling me that there's no, because they, they kept saying there's no precedent, so they would tell me all these things about it that were wrong. Sorry, I'm really, like, I'm really backing into this question, I'm sorry. Um, and they would say, oh, you know, it doesn't sell, doesn't sell, there's no precedent. And I would be like, dude, Chuck Klosterman? Like, whatever, Chuck and I do different things. Uh, it's like Rob Sheffield had just had a couple really big books, Love is a Mixtape, which is like personal slash criticism slash memoir slash. But I knew all of these fucking dudes in my world who were essentially putting out collections of their music criticism. And I just thought this is, but they were like, well, the only precedent for what you're doing is um, um, Ellen Willis. And it was a very slim, posthumous collection of her work that was mostly from the New Yorker and the Village Voice pre-1980. She was the first pop, so Ellen Willis was the first pop critic at the New Yorker and she was, um, she was partners with Robert Criscow at the time and very, very good friends with Grill Marcus. And so she's like literally in the, you know, two of the, two of the people that, um, two of the writers that contemporary are, are, are basically, you know, really helped innovate the form of, of modern rock criticism, criticism. And she's in the room for all of that. She's pushing their ideas. She's telling them they're stupid. She's, you know, fighting with them about Bob Dylan. And she's very frequently erased from that because she did not continue on the path with music criticism. And... And they would say, well, you know, they would point to Ellen Lewis and go, um, well, that only sold like 4,000 copies. As if that was like a barometer for what the 
the one, you know, this one thing, that that was the whole barometer of what the collectively held cultural interest in feminist criticism was. And they're like, so yeah, so what you're doing is not gonna fly. And I just thought, you are, you're stupid. <laughs> and, and I just said, this book's gonna do really well. I know it's going to, da, da, da. no one believed me, except for my friend who, you know, at Featherproof, and he, he, you know, he was in the same world, the same milieu as I was, and he knew that my work was something that people talked about and debated and like hated and loved and would fight about and, um, and that be, for that reason, it was important to collect it. So we, we did that in 2015. And then right around the time that it came out, um, uh, well, one, when we were getting ready to um, put it out, they're like, um, we're, we just did the, the on sale for it or whatever. And they're like, um, we're, we're already going to go into our third pressing we're going into our fourth pressing. So it had sold through its fourth pressing by the time it came out, um, which is very good. And uh, was already like more than we thought the whole thing would sell. And it, it sold like 10,000 copies, just like straight out the gate. And, um, and got uh, an incredible review in the New York Times and all of these things that were like, really made it feel like it was very meant to be in that time and place. And then also there was like a, I had put a, I had posed a question on Twitter, purely like wondering like, you know, women was, when was the first time you really felt like alienated or were someone very purposely kind of tried to tell you you didn't belong in music? And it, w it went very, um, went viral went very viral. I was like the next day where I'm like getting responses in German and it was like insane. And it was at that time, I don't want to say it was kind of like um, some of these conversations around misogyny and sexual assault and rape culture and music had sort of been bubbling up in a lot of ways since I had done this R. Kelly piece. And um, which was then like the um, first time that R. Kelly had been asked to publicly comment on the fact that he was a child rapist in almost 20 years. And it was on the radio the next day. It was a big deal. So anyways, there was a little, like a little bit more of that was starting to like happen within music culture. And then I did this tweet and it was like, Time Magazine was reporting on it the next week. Like, it was a big fucking deal. And I was very suddenly going, like, literally around the world to talk about my book and talk about these ideas and um, be people's, like, token woman on a fucking music festival. Like, going to, like, the South by Southwest of Germany. And <laughs> people are like, why should we pay attention to this? You know? Um, <laughs> And then like women standing up and like crying and um, there's a talk that I did um, in Australia that I was going to give one talk and I just, I fully like went off script because um, some women had come and talked to me before I was getting up there to do like, you know, vaguely like a book talk or whatever it was that I was going to do. And they said, you know, there's something that's happening in the scene here, and we're so glad you're coming to talk, because like, no one wants to talk about feminism or rape culture, da 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 da. And um, women are being, there's been like a rash of of women being uh, drugged at punk pop shows and raped. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was like in the <laughs> big like sold out auditorium, like a thousand people, it was insane. Australia, people love to go to like any cultural event, I think, I don't think it was me. And, um, and then I talked for like 20 minutes and I just like, we just like, I was like, pass, pass the mic into the audience, I wanna hear what people's experiences are. And um, it was like a very sort of landmark, intense thing. Um, what was the question? <laughs> trying to remember myself. Um, but yeah, so anyways, the book came out. Mm. It was 
bigger than uh, I imagined. It sold a lot of copies. It took me around the world. I went to four continents and a dozen countries and did like 65 speaking events just in the US alone in 18 months and fully lost my mind being on, like just sleeping on planes. I did not see my kids <laughs> for, uh, for a really long time. Um, and working at Pitchfork all at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I w again, I could talk about the, each of these topics for a while. I wanna make sure there's time for questions that there will be, so. Yeah, maybe ask me one more question. I'll just give you like another 20 minute answer. That's, that might be, well, that, I think that's, that, that, that might be This is like do. my one woman show at this point. It's perfect. <laughs> They've heard me talk. They know who I am. Um, but, but do they really, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I'm glad you mentioned Pitchfork because this was, this book came out. Dude, I worked there for 11 months. M I let's know. keep it moving. Well, I guess well, that's kind of my question. Actually, I do want to, I want to correct one small thing because titles fucking matter. Okay. Um, in the intro, it said I was senior editor at the Pitchfork Review, which I was for one issue. Uh, because, so Pitchfork Review, little, may, maybe no one knows us, maybe somebody knows us. All right, there we go. All right, all right, okay. Three of you. The old cool. heads. Um, the Pitchfork Review was a short lived for like two, for I think total nine issues. Um, 200 page, beautiful well, magazine. First issue is kind of coming down the pike. And I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm not gonna name names. Everybody can just figure this shit out. So, um, but I'm telling you this because it's gonna, it's, it, this might be like a little, like there's a lot of folks in this room who this might apply to as you are uh, women and femmes going into the music industry perhaps. I hope so. All right, so, you know, I'm working known critic, blah, blah, blah. And this man calls me and he's like, I'm doing a print magazine. I'm editing a print magazine for Pitchfork. Um, I want you to do this thing. And it should be like this, this, and this. He had no fucking idea what he was talking about. And I was like, no one wants to read 20,000 words on that. And you also don't need a round table with five people. And like, and he's like, well, why don't you just like take this over? And he wanted me to do this work for free. And I was like, well, I'll work on this piece. But you have to pay me, you know, pay me for this piece. But like, you know, da 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 da. Comes out, sends me a copy, and I am just like, my eyes are like rolling into the back of my head like a fucking slot machine. Like it is, I was just like, this is so, this is so boring. It is so macho, and it is such a waste of a magazine with such real potential. Because it looked gorgeous. They had these incredible women working, making the magazine look great. And I was like, this is like, no one wants to read about, like, this is boring. This is super boring. And so I sort of knew, I had like written maybe like three reviews for Pitchfork. Um, I was way, wary, very wary at the time. It was like a man's, 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 man's world over there, to paraphrase James Brown. Um, and so I called the dude that I knew there, and I was like, the man who is editing this magazine is calling me all the time and asking me for all of my ideas for free, as happens. Um, if that's the fucking case, you should just hire me to run this magazine because this is, this is boring. And um, they said, okay, well give us a proposal what would you do with 50 pages of the magazine? And so I was like, this is how I would do it. This is like, da -da. and I just like full tilt, 50 page proposal, basically. And they're like, okay, we'll start you as senior editor. And then the next, the next one, you'll become the editor in chief. So in that, it said that I was the senior editor. I was the editor in chief of that magazine because I asked to be. Um, it's a lot easier when, for a woman to get a job when the man that has it is failing. Um, <laughs> it is literally called the glass cliff. Um, it is a phenomenon. But um, I did that. I did that for a while. It was really good. 
And um, it was just like four women making the magazine, me and Laura Snapes, who's now the music editor at The Guardian, um, edited it. And you want to ask something? Well, it's funny because you're talking about how good it was. And that was actually where I was going to kind of go with it. Because um, you could, anyone could probably guess I'm going to tell you on one more board. thing, though. OK, tell me the I'm thing. I'm going to tell you one more thing. And they're like, well, you can't just work on that magazine full time. So you have to work for the website. And I was like, oh, my god. Oh my God, is that what I want to do? I had never had a job before uh, since I had worked at a record store. I had not worked with other people. I hadn't like gone to a place and like worked with men at desks and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So I said, yes. Okay. Like, I'll do this in order to do this magazine that like no one reads. And, um, and, uh, it was really wild to work at Pitchfork. Um, I was the first woman ever hired at a senior position. There was other women who had se is, were in senior roles there, but they had started, they'd all started at interns. And so they were like very baked into the pie. And I'm not saying they are like, they just had a different relationship with men and power there. And um, you know, like, if I am your first woman, if I'm your first senior woman, that's like, that's kind of like, you might be in for a rough ride, you know? Um, so I spent 11 months there, and then that, that uh, little magazine got me a job running MTV News. And then I was like, I'll go, I'll, I'll go do that. <laughs> um, and I went there, and I hired, um, I'm, I, th this, is, this is not even your question, but I hired um, Dorian St. Felix, I hired Hanif Abdurraqib, who at that time was like writing for weeklies in Columbus, Carvel Wallace, um, Megan Garvey, Hazel Sills, who now runs NPR, um, music, oh God, who all did we have? Um, a couple of people who, who eventually went back to Pitchfork where I hired them away. If anything happened, I hired one person away from Pitchfork every week for five weeks <laughs> just to terrorize them. It was so good. <laughs> we'll leave it there. Well, okay, we can leave it there. Um, no, I think I did want to talk about the magazine briefly, and because it was unfortunately brief. Um, and for those it that aren't familiar. So it, it was, was so that's good. what I was going to say about it. Like, it, it, it felt like, the, but it felt really, it holding it felt like the promise of something like, of a future that never really happened. And I guess I was curious, boots on the ground there, why? It actually, fe and, and at a deeper question, not just because of Pitchfork, it almost felt like criticism went in a completely different, it felt like the promise, this is the future that music criticism could be. And then at that it's point, what we it did at MTV News. Exact opposite it was, direction. It was like the. It was. Yeah. It was kind of a funny thing because it was very different. It was very different than Pitchfork. Very it was very different than Pitchfork, and um, you know, my tenure at Pitchfork was not easy. I think for, it wasn't easy for me. I have PTSD um, in part because of that, from being a woman in the music industry. That is like people are like. Oh, you stuck around for a long time. This may maybe this worked out for you. That's why you're still here, right? Like, and people would always say, like, you managed to stick it out. Like, what's the secret? Like, you must have figured out the secret. No, I have PC. I have PTSD. Like, diagnosed PTSD from working in the music industry for as long as I did, including at Pitchfork. That was kind of like the thing that broke me. I think. Um, I believe it. Yeah, it was a very intense time, and. Uh, but also it was like everything that was kind of post R. Kelly, that was also a very intense thing post my book um, coming out and kind of the beginning of like a real uh, Me Too movement, proto Me Too movement, like what I don't even know what we were, were calling it then um, in music. And because I had done that story, literally like every person who had similar experiences would come to me and say, is this a story? So. I'm like a Rolodex of um, everybody in music who's a rapist. And most of those stories never came out. So um, the funny thing was that when I was at Pitchfork, um, when I first started there, I didn't find this out until months and months later, that they were sort of um, 
testing the water a little bit to see if, um, if I would be the editor-in-chief, if it would be a good fit, because they are ready to like revamp it. And um, that didn't happen, <laughs> and then I'm totally fine that it didn't. And um, because I did have this different idea about criticism, and I really wanted to bring, and this is something that I've always done, is like, I try to bring the whole gang with me, you know? And I, I was always so hungry for those voices and those perspectives and I didn't want, you know, the, the, the music criticism that I like inherited or that I came into was very much this, this thing of where it was like about aesthetics and you couldn't have like a personally informed opinion and I would get all these dudes all the time telling me like, when are you going to drop this feminist lens and get into real criticism? I mean, Greg Cott said that to me once. <laughs> I mean, we're friends now, but I was like, oh, for real? You know, like, um, and, but that was really pervasive. That was really pervasive. And being able to kind of helm this section within Pitchfork and this magazine and see that I could totally kind of like money ball this like, team of people who were so good, but were like kind of in these different weird cloisters or just writing for a newsletter. And I was like, these people are like really ready for prime time. Like let's, let's get it, let's get the gang all together and put on a show. And that was really what the Pitchfork review was about, was like, I was like, these people are totally underutilized. And, um, and I'm not saying, a, all that I did anything other than notice that they could write, you know. I found all of those people like through Twitter and you know social media, friends of friends of friends, where people saying, "Oh, did you see this great thing that this dude in Columbus wrote about Master P?" That's how I found Hanif, you know. And then I edited his book. Yeah. Um. Sorry, we're still in like 2015, and I it's know. like and it's like 11 p.m. We're not even. At, we're never gonna get to the women who rock. We'll get there in one second. I so. will. Let, I will try to be a little bit more lightning round rather than like. Um, I will try to because I, I have like a million follow-ups, and I want to make sure there's time for the audience they're questions. Sleeping. People they're are sleeping, sleeping out there. I just hear snoring in the back yeah. row. <laughs> um, I want to talk about night moves because it's a bit of a departure, and yet it also feels very much like. It was like you're, you were documenting like a feeling almost rather than documenting um, like a, a band or something. But I guess I was, I was just curious from your perspective kind of, I guess, yeah, what made you want to write Night Moves? Um, like what was the intention there? And um, Night Moves was my, it's music memoir, but it was sort of like this, um, I had a very active blog <laughs> back when that was, you know, a thing that was exciting, um, but it was where I put a lot of like my very voicey, like personal writing, and, um, and the blog had gone away. It was pretty popular, you know what is popular in two thousand and four. I don't know, whatever. Uh, but I'd also done fanzines and stuff like that, and 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 it was just um, it was kind of my life right at the time when I was starting to become a professional writer. And I felt like, um, it's, it's not like it's like my just kids, it's not a linear story about becoming an artist in any way, really. It's very sort of cut up and disjunctive, but, um, but Chicago and the music scene in Chicago had changed a lot since then and so in some ways it was very much like a document of a time. Um, and place that uh, is largely erased. And, and my career changed and my life changed, but it was sort of, um, that was, I wanted to put all of that writing together someplace and um, it's kind of more diaristic writing, memoirish writing, impressionistic writing. Um, Hanif told me it's a book of poetry. I was like, no, no, it's not. <laughs> but uh, the, and so I just wanted to put that book out, and I I, w I wanted to do it with my uh, with my folks at University of Texas Press, where I'm one of the editors of the American Music series of 
books because they do a good job. And I wanted to be like, you know, um, this is a reference that maybe three people in this room are old enough to get, but it's like a very hair club for men. Like, not only am I, you know, uh, a member, but, you know, uh, the, because they just did a good job and I just wanted like a little, I wanted a little book that people could fit in a pocket. Yeah, and I'm glad you talked about it, trying to capture time and a place, because that's that was kind of like my exact um, Have a good night. <laughs> my exact thoughts on it. It really does a good job of capturing like an era that if you didn't really live through, it's kind of hard to articulate. Like when I talk to younger people, um, and I'm like, it's hard to articulate what that era was, but I feel like you do a really it's a book good where job in that book. Progressively over the course of like three years, um, everybody gets a cell phone. It's very that's that's when it happened. Um, but, and you mentioned the editor of the American Music Series, it's a good segue, finally, into the present, right? Um, I guess, what are you doing now? You just finished this, this docu-series. I'm curious if there is a follow-up and if you sort of are going to try to fully transition into, into documentary film work or if that was like I a... I have already. Have you already? I have already. What's going on? Um, so... And, and tell me a little about the project and how it came about. Um, okay, so... Okay, American, uh, American Music Series, I've been doing for a while. Uh, it's, it's a, it is a, what am I trying to say? It's a series that's just uh, music, limited to music memoirs, musician memoirs, or m music based memoirs, music in America, loosely. Um, I, we push that as far as we possibly can, and then uh, the only other thing that happens in that series is um, uh, like critical biography, not straight biography. Like really, like it's got to have a, it's got to have a big idea behind it. And um, that was already the the sort of scope of how this series was endowed. And then they um, they asked me to take it over. And at that point, it had um, just been books that were like mostly like Americana. It's like books about John Prine and old Ryan Adams. And uh, and I came in and I was like, let's do a book with Hanif and let's do a book with Sasha Geffen and let's do, you know. So, um, um, and that's going really, really well. And that's super fun. And, and that really kind of gets out my, um, um, in part because music journalism and its viability as a thing thing where people can put out a big idea and stretch out, it like kind of doesn't really exist unless you're freelancing for the New Yorker, maybe, or someplace else, you know, that pays anything at all. And so um, doing books is kind of the one of those ways that I can still get that part of me going. Uh, documentary work. Okay, so 2016, October of 2016, I go to MTV News it's being rebooted after being like kind of basically dormant um, and publishing like clickbait for like a couple years. Like, uh, and it's being rebooted by my, the man that would become one of my mentors, uh, Dan Fearman, who had started Grantland. And uh, he was bringing all these really storied, incredible culture journalists there. So once we're at MTV News, we have like the fucking dream team, and um, I get to start working in video and uh, producing and directing was so natural for me. It was such an it was like instantaneous. Like this is loved work. You know, like I just and I made all these kind of like short docs while I was there, you know, about like whatever artists that we had access to, whether it was like Migos or um, did a really incredible one on Kirk Franklin. Like just kind of like all these different, you know, 1975 when they were like still playing to like a thousand people. It was like really, but like we could do so much in part because MTV still kind of had this like Cachet. And the first, the first thing that I did that was all my own there was, um, it never got broadcast other than little pieces. But uh, it was like a 25-minute 
um, Prince retrospective when he died. And one of the people in it at the time is Lizzo, who like was, didn't even, I, I don't think she even had a record. Um, and, and I just loved it. And it was like, it felt like how it did when I was first writing. It was like, I was like, oh, th no, this is the thing. This is a thing where I can really like learn something new and stretch out. Because also the other thing too, at that point I'd been writing for like 20 years, 25 years, I don't know, a long ass time. And I, um, I had brought a lot of my big ideas as a critic to their logical conclusion. Like if you read my book, it's like there's certain ideas that I'm like digging at for like 20 years. And then I got there and I was like, well that's all I have to say about that. And I needed to do, I needed to do a more at least while I kind of got my other ideas together. And, um, and so I started doing documentary work, I started doing podcasts, loved doing that. Um, start doing more and more, but I, I'm, I, we're there for like not even two years. Viacom blows up MTV News because the uh, folks in the newsroom very rightly moved to unionize. Um, then I went to Spotify for like eight months. I made like a documentary about U2 and like Metallica and stuff. I made 150 videos while I was there. We had like a ginormous budget, like insane, made all these things every week that it was like, it was definitely content more than it was documentary. And left there, do some more podcasts, blah, 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 blah. Uh, what is two years ago? What was that like? So late, like early fall 2021, I get this call or get, a, get an email from these Canadian dudes who are like, we would like to talk to you about writing for this docu-series called Women Who Rock. And I was like, this sounds generic. Like, this is like, uh, you know, uh, this is like, <laughs> whatever. So these guys call me and I was like, okay, you know, always take the meeting. That's my other advice, always take the meeting. And they're like, yeah, so we won't talk to you about writing this thing. I keep them, uh, maybe you can understand because I'm very talkative. We stay on the phone for two hours. It's a half, it was like a half an hour, like get to know you meeting. And I'm telling them everything they need to do with their fucking documentary series for it to, not be stupid. And I'm like talking to them like that the whole time. Because um, I don't think anything's gonna come of it. And then Monday, the following Monday, they call me with an offer to direct the series. And they said, you know, you guys, the longest thing I have ever made where I directed it entirely on my own for broadcast is like 11 minutes long. Mm -hmm. And this is a docu-series for like premium cable TV. They're like, don't worry, we'll, we'll help you. But you got it. You like you understand every part of this. Um, and I was like, okay. And the and the offer was great. And I was like, yes, I'm very interested in doing TV. And um, they already had like the outline of it, and they had Shaka Khan and Mavis Staples and uh, Nancy Wilson from Heart and Shania Twain and Cheryl Crow and. Um, half a dozen other women already attached to it. There's 41 women in the documentary uh, series. And um, it's now broadcast in like, I don't know, like 50 countries. I mean, it got picked up everywhere. It's, you can watch it in Estonia now. Um, and so the la uh, now I'm uh, producing a feature film that is a feature documentary film feature length documentary film that is based on a piece of my own writing and I can't talk about it yet, but it will be announced soon. And I have a couple other things in development. I have three podcasts in development. And I started a production company with my sister who um, was the publisher of Rookie Magazine. If anyone remembers Rookie, mm -hmm. you know, runs in the family. And, um, and so we now have a production company and we're mostly just uh, working on developing feminist music content for podcasts, film, TV, um, and books. And that's what I do now. 
And also, I'm, I am writing a book that I've been working on for several years. I didn't work on it at all during the pandemic, if it makes anybody feel better. Mm. Um, That's amazing. Um, and this has been amazing. This has been a real pleasure. It's been... I think people are falling asleep. I know we got... That's why I'm trying to wrap it up a little okay, bit. Good. So, No, it's been, it's been really amazing having you here. I'm I really asleep. appreciate you coming.